Hey there, this is Steve Lee with Veritas Catholic Network. Pope Francis declared this the year of St. Joseph. We'll get Bishop Frank's thoughts on this, as well as the COVID vaccines out there, on today's Let Me Be Frank. And then in the second segment, Bishop Frank will dive into the subject of prayer. First, did you know that you can take Veritas Catholic Network with you wherever you go? Yep. You can have Veritas on your phone to listen to our live broadcast, grab podcasts of Let Me Be Frank and Restless and more. It's with you wherever you go. Just download the Veritas Catholic Network app at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or visit www.veritascatholic.com. All right, and welcome back to Let Me Be Frank, everybody. It is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Good to see you, Steve. Steve, uh, Christmas is coming. We got to get ready. Ooh, huh? It's close. <laughs> it's close. Yeah, it's just, getting close. Just ask my 11 year old girl. <laughs> oh, I know. I can imagine. I can hey, imagine. And, and by the way, happy year of St. Joseph. Yeah, that, didn't that come as a surprise? <laughs> A bad, yeah, a bit too much of a surprise, <laughs> in so much as we're not prepared. <laughs> we were not, we didn't quite, yeah. I mean, Pope Francis, to his credit, has basically kind of locked up all of the leaks that you know the Vatican was famous for. Yeah, but I mean, of the substance to it, it's tremendous, and you know, a, a number of wonderful people have written to me over the last year asking for the diocese to be consecrated to Saint Joseph. Ah, oh, okay. And um, and I'm very much open to it. The general consensus, though, internally, is that with all the challenges we're facing now, um, the the hope would have been to wait until we get back more to normalcy, where we could celebrate it with large diocesan events and stuff. But the Holy Father, obviously, has asked us to do this. He's consecrated the church to it, dedicated. So we will do the same in Bridgeport, right? And there's some talk internally now of trying to kick it off on the feast of saint joseph for us so that we're prepared awesome so yeah i mean have we spoken of joseph before yes let me ask you a question how do you image joseph yeah so i know that um that uh, a lot of painters have made him an older man and Mm -hmm. my understanding is that that was an artistic choice done by some early painters to kind of protect the idea of Mary's virginity. But um, I picture him, you know, uh, younger. And by younger, I mean at least as young as I am. (laughs) Because he needed to be strong and um, able to take his family across (laughs) to Egypt and protect them along the way and have a career to, you know, teach Jesus carpentry and all this stuff. I like to picture him strong and vigorous. Not that I am, but yes, younger. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting because I had this conversation with seminarians and they image Joseph the same way. And I shared with them what um, my rabbi friend um, shared with me many years ago about St. Joseph Mm -hmm. and how he images Joseph as an older man uh, precisely because it's more consonant with... um, with what Jewish culture at the time would have expected. In other words, um, there's a thought that Joseph was not only older, but a widower. And that he took on Mary and protected Mary um, because he, at the time, a woman with no spouse would really have been subject to uh, social ostracism, to be ostracized. Right. And actually poverty, but she had already vowed virginity. And so he would have been the ideal man, man to have protected her, entering into the betrothal and marriage, um, not seeking of anything other than to love and protect Mary. And uh, so it's an interesting, but both, but we don't know until we actually get to heaven. If we do get to heaven, and then we'll meet Saint Joseph. So it's interesting. It's different aspects of what you consider strong, right. young, vigorous, going to Egypt, or strong in that quiet, mature strength that allows you to literally lift up a younger person. And make that younger person the center of your life, not your own needs, desires, comfort, whatever else that you've worked your whole life to do. Yeah. So the different aspects, right? It's fascinating. Yeah. Right? Yeah, definitely. You know, even um, my own dad 
well into his 60s was very physically very strong so mm -hmm. maybe it's yeah a little of both <laughs> and the life expectancy of joseph who knows i mean yeah I, yeah i just wondered to myself would a young vigorous man keep his mouth closed and not say anything <laughs> in sacred scripture who am i to say i'm not young for what i know <laughs> it's an interesting question <laughs> uh you know <laughs> Uh, since we're talking about um, more current events, I do want to ask you, Excellency, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. this week we started getting COVID vaccines uh, beginning to be administered, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. which seems great. Um, mm -hmm. And if you remember a while back, a listener did uh, ask a question to you about them. Now we have more specifics. Um, and, you know, I just read this morning that the U.S. Bishops Conference has said that Catholics can take two of the three available vaccines even though they were developed with a very remote connection to morally comp right. compromised lines. Right. Yeah. They also said that we should not allow the pandemic to um, desensitize or weaken our determination to oppose mm -hmm. the evil of abortion. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. help us walk this line here, Excellency. Yeah, it's, it's uh, funny you should say this. It's, it's an extraordinarily important topic. Um, I ask that the instruction from the Committee on Doctrine at the USCCB be posted on the Diocesan website. So the instruction that came to me is now available for anybody in the diocese to read. And basically, you've summarized it very well. It is, it is the remote connection or cooperation with what is gravely evil. To what extent is that permissible? To what extent is it so far remote that it allows, uh, it's permissible to, to engage in that which was created. And um, so it's cooperation with evil is really what it comes down to. And the, um, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine only used, they used a line of cells from an aborted fetus, I believe from the 1960s, the line is still in existence. Mm -hmm for the testing of the vaccine, but not for its design or creation. So while there is some connection, it is so far removed from the actual vaccine itself. That is why the bishops say it is permissible to take those two. AstraZeneca, on the other hand, my understanding is that those lines of cells from aborted uh, fetuses were actually played a part in the design of the vaccine. What I did not know is that the rubella vaccine, at least a form of it, has the exact same problem as huh. the AstraZeneca vaccine. So the bishops are counseling that the AstraZeneca should not be used. A Catholic should not take that vaccine and choose one of the others. But then again, if there is no possibility of choice, then there's something that has to be weighed there, right? And I think that becomes much more of a conversation between the person, perhaps the parish priest, right? Because it weighs on the vulnerability of the state of life of the individual as well. Right. Right. So you're weighing different factors. But luckily, the one that's coming to Connecticut is basically Pfizer's. So I think for our people in our diocese, at least, I think there's relative security that they can take it if you're comfortable taking it because then there's a whole nother level here and a lot of my friends uh, from you know back home in Brooklyn uh, when I speak with them they are almost unanimously suspicious of taking something that was created so quickly right right and tested the way it was tested because their, their response to me is typical it's very typical you know, well, if you could do it in seven months, why can't you always do it in seven months? Why does it take five or six years? So, so, so something, something gives here. And I say that, but, but that's because there's an urgency. It doesn't mean that corners were cut. But you know how we are. I mean, it's... So I don't know if, if, if our listeners may have not so much the moral considerations, which I think the bishops have addressed, but just the practical considerations. Is it safe at that point, you have to trust what's being said to you or distrust what's being said to you. In the end, there is no other proof to offer. Right. And I guess people will make different decisions. Yeah. But the, but the letter is about nine pages long, and I would urge everyone to read it. 
because it's very well done. Yeah. Hmm? Boy, the, the Bishop's Conference has been really active this year. <laughs> oh, mean, yeah, my been goodness. There's been a lot to... Right. And you know what else is interesting, too? And I, I may be wrong in this, but I don't believe I am. The bishops, the different Episcopal conferences are not giving the same guidance. Hmm. So in the United States, it's very clear what, what I just said. Two right. are acceptable, one is problematic. In the UK, though, and now correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the bishops of the United Kingdom have given much more of a green light to the AstraZeneca vaccine. Am I correct? I, I saw that as well, yes. Yep. Yeah, so you see, I find that a bit problematic because that confuses people, right? right? So if it's morally objectionable, it's morally objectionable, period, regardless. But it could very well be that the AstraZeneca vaccine is the one that's coming to the United Kingdom first. Yeah. That I do not know. But, but the desensitization that the letter ends that the American bishops is something we always have to be mindful of. You can't allow expediency to be your moral determinant. Right. Then you have gone off the cliff. Yeah. Right? You've gone off the cliff. Yeah. Maybe maybe this would um this begs a, a deeper discussion for a future episode about um the degrees of moral culpability. Uh, and cooperation with evil. Right. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Right. And you know what? If I may just say this yeah. too before we move on. Uh it's something we have to reckon with because all those years that the federal government was financing abortions through Medicare, but Medicaid in particular. And we all pay taxes. In some way, shape or form, what's the level of cooperation with that? Yeah. So it, it's not uh, an esoteric theological question. It's really very much a lived question in life. Yes. No different than if you work for a military contractor and those bombs and whatever you're building kill civilians. What's your level of cooperation there? So it is something we really should talk about because it is, it's, it's an important part of discerning how to be a disciple in the modern world. Yeah. So um, I'll just make a note that we should avoid a hate mail about you're not telling anybody not to pay taxes. <laughs> no, 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 because they'll arrest me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> No, but but you but but the point is that in society the way it's structured, um, we are either voluntarily in the position, such as whether you take a vaccine or not, and sometimes you put in a position where collectively we find ourselves in a situation not of our making, where our resources, our taxes, may be going to issues that clearly violate Catholic teaching. Right. So what do you do? And to stop and to stop paying taxes may sound noble, besides putting you into jail. Um, but then you're not funding education, you're not funding health care, you're not funding the the services to the poor and the needy. So how is that forced? I mean, it, that's what I mean. It's complicated. It's very complex. Yes. Right? Yep. And simple yes or no answers usually don't don't address the question correctly. Right. Hence the nine pages in the letter from the bishops. Right. 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 So, mm -hmm. and, and I do want to get to your reflections on the fourth Sunday of Advent, but before we do, I read something so cool and it totally reminded mm -hmm. me of you because of your love of astronomy. Yep. So I, I read that on Monday, this is uh, December 21st. So this upcoming Monday, the planets mm -hmm. Jupiter and Saturn will appear a 10th of a degree apart in the night sky. It's something called right. a great conjunction. And they call it the Star of Bethlehem too. Okay, so tell the us. Christmas effects. The Christmas. Well, see, astronomically, I'm not exactly sure. I think it happens every 600 years, if I remember correctly. But um, to the untrained eye, to look, it will appear as if it is a unique heavenly manifestation of light. Now, considering how far away these planets are. Let's consider we're talking billions of, 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 of miles away. And yet they still reflect the light of the sun. And it is on the winter solstice. So it is the darkest night of the year. 
Mm. Okay. So could that have been um, the natural cause for the miraculous uh, invitation of the Magi to start their journey? Okay. I, I don't know. I mean, that there was a miraculous intervention is clear from the scriptures, and I believe that with all my heart. Is there also a natural root to it? It'd be interesting to see, and I, that I do not know what the astronomical, kind of like the, the the chart would say. But it's still neat, isn't it? It's. I mean, it's, it's wrought with so much symbolism. Yes, yeah, it's so cool because if it was the same astronomical phenomenon 2,000 mm -hmm. years ago, how awesome that we can see that. But even if it's not, here it comes on Christmas. There is this one, what looks like one bright Christmas right. star. Right, right. And the other thing too is, it speaks to what miracles are. Okay, so manif miracles are manifestations of divine power in the natural order that seemingly do not follow the rules we have discerned govern the natural order. For what purpose? Not for a magical display, but to indicate the inbreaking of God's kingdom. That's why Jesus performed miracles. It's to teach a greater truth, not for people to marvel at, ooh, how did he do that? It's not a question of how he did that, he's God. <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> point is, why did he do that? What is he teaching from that, right? So in this case too, Looking at that phenomenon, every Christian should look and say, what is God teaching me now from the natural order of things, about the supernatural meaning of things, that on the darkest of the nights, that this light shines to all of us to see, believer and non-believer alike. And a person who's non-believer will look and say, astronomical phenomenon, big deal. <laughs> a person who's a believer will ask that question and say, what is God teaching me? And can actually, it could become an occasion of deepening faith. So what one person considers phenomenon, another person can consider miraculous because of the greater truth that's being told. Hmm. And what's the difference? It's your faith. It's the eyes of faith, right? Between the two. Yeah. So I think it's a beautiful way in a pandemic that was so filled with so many days of darkness to have this happen this year above all others, right? Yes. Yeah. That maybe uh, is a great way to lead right into uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent. Yes, Our Lady. So Our, Lady's, Our Lady is the prime figure, right, of the fourth Sunday of Advent. You know, it's interesting. I've been reading a lot about um, uh, divine intimacy. And what's interesting is that when we speak about the indwelling of grace, we're really talking about both receiving the grace of the redemption that comes to us in the death and resurrection of Jesus, as well as being a, a temple of the Holy Spirit where he continues to dwell. So you receive the effects of redemption but the spirit then says, okay, you're done, I leave. He dwells with us, right? So when Elizabeth said to Mary, hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? I think though that line is some, it is one of the most poignant lessons in all of the scriptures, particularly in the New Testament. Who am I that the mother of my Lord comes to me? The she who is full of grace, who is the, who is the living temple of the Holy Spirit, right? not just in spirit, but in corporality, because it's from her comes the Savior of the world. See, that, in my mind, in the fourth Sunday of Advent, Our Lady is given to us to reflect upon because it puts us in the proper frame of mind to sit 
or kneel before the infant Jesus when he's born and ask ourselves, am I willing to welcome you into my life, my heart? Can I not only receive you as my Redeemer, but allow your spirit to dwell within me? Can I ever be full of grace? Never to the extent of Our Lady, but fuller than what I am now in grace. So that's the gift of Christmas. My goodness gracious, not that other stuff that we waste money on, time and paper and wrapping and all this. Oh, that's lovely. It's wonderful. It makes me, particularly for young kids, I love giving the kids gifts. I just love it. Yeah. But, but the gift gets wrapped in swaddling clothes, not mm. in Christmas paper. Right? So he comes to redeem and he comes to indwell. Mary has both. So Mary receives, and we talked about this Immaculate Conception, she receives ahead of time that grace. So now she stands there and says, will you follow my lead? That's what I think the fourth Sunday of Advent is, that eager, burning expectation. The other thing is we talked about the Christmas Novena. I find the days from the 17th of December to the 24th of December, the O Antiphons are beautiful. They're beautiful because they're the bridge to the faith of our Jewish brothers and sisters who we believe now, for us, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Right? And, um, and therefore, when we pray evening prayer with Our Lady in the background, right? Every night, one other O Antiphon draws us closer until we come, O come, O come, Emmanuel, which is the Lord Jesus. So, I'm not sure that's, that is a, an organized reflection on the fourth Sunday of Advent, because it's not Sunday yet, so I have, to, I have time <laughs> to put these thoughts in there. But if you were to ask me what my heart is saying, that's ultimately what my heart is saying in anticipation of the fourth Sunday of Advent. Yeah, awesome. And the O Antiphon, so they start tomorrow on the 17th, and right. um, I'm sure the we 24th. can... the 24th. Right. And then we can just, uh, people can just go online, I'm sure, and find... A reflection each day, or will you, will you go on, you, go online and Google "O Come, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel" the hymn, which I think we all know since we're kids, because every stanza starts with one of the O antiphons. They're all there; all yeah. of them are there. Yeah. And and what I do in my own little world when I pray evening prayer, I often do not do this, but in these days I do. I sing the opening hymn by myself because I usually pray by myself. And I use the O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. So every night I add the next stanza until you pray the entire hymn, which is on the eve of Christmas. It's great. It's beautiful. Awesome. awesome. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What a strong way to finish preparing for Christmas, you know. And ending the year we've lived through. Yeah. You know, and, and even though... I must confess, maybe it's my own way of looking at things. I am I don't feel as trapped now as I did in March and April. Even though the situation is objectively worse now than it was in March and April. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure why, but I think a lot of it has to do with the hope of Christmas. And that's the Christmas effect. Yeah. Right. Even in the darkest night, the star shines, right? Yes. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Excellency, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll, we're going to dive into the topic of prayer. Amen. Catholic Radio works, and now we have it here in Connecticut and New York. It's been seen around the country that there's no better tool for evangelization. Where there's Catholic Radio, the folks who listen deepen their faith. Families are strengthened. Parishes and communities flourish. So, let people know you're listening to Veritas. Tell your friends to tune in, and let's make an impact here for Jesus and His Church. This is Steve Lee for Veritas Catholic Network. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank, everybody. Um, Excellency, in the uh, very second show that you did back in March, you talked about prayer. And I think it's always worth diving back into um, and seeing how we can continue to deepen our prayer lives, especially 
as you were talking about here uh, in Advent. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, may I open with an observation? Yes, of course. It, um, in one of the spiritual writers that I am reading, he speaks about custody of the senses. And the larger context is to guard the senses so that they do not admit distraction and frivolity and nonsense, or worse, or worse, to upset the inner peace that one should have in that inner room that the scriptures the Lord speaks of, where you do pray. And you know what? I've given, I, give, I have given that a lot of reflection, even in my own life, because I like to think I live a reflective life. But in fact, many times I don't. And it's all ministerial business, work, right? And yet it can be distracting. And so if we want to develop a prayer life, one of the necessary steps is to ask yourself, what do I engage in using my senses that either lead me to a deeper awareness of God or distract me away from that awareness of God. Because without that awareness of God, prayer becomes a formal exercise, but not what it's meant to be, which is communion with God. And given all the distractions we have in, in life, I think it's something we all have to consider. And what, I am, what I'm coming to appreciate, it's not always bad things that are distracting us. It could even be good things that can distract us, such as pastoral ministry. Yeah. Right. So, so what I'm hearing then is, um, even when we're doing work and doing things not prayer time, um, we should make sure that we're filling ourselves, we're filling ourselves with something, right? So we should be filling ourselves with something that's good and not just noise. All right. Yeah, well, for example, if you are running, when I used to go to the gym and I would run the treadmill, which I hated to do, but my trainer forced me to, um, the part I hated the most was not even the running. It was the cooling down at the end because, uh, you know, it took a while for my heart to get back to, you know, a normal rhythm. And that's when you do most of your perspiring, believe it or not, is when you're yeah. cooling down, right? Okay, so let's do the spiritual analogy, right? You're running on a treadmill, thousand distractions, phones, this, that, so texts, the other, messages, emails, people, calls, work, this, that, and the other. All of it is not evil or bad in itself, but it's got you on the, the treadmill of life. Now, prayer is meant to be that place when you go into the inner room of your life in quiet and just sit with the Lord. So it's the uh, cooling off period that's essential. Hmm. But do we do that? And sometimes it takes a long time just to cool down so that you can be quiet again. Because otherwise, who are we talking to in our prayer? <laughs> Ourselves. Yeah. And that has become a real challenge yeah. because we're becoming more frenetic. And quite frankly, in, in the pandemic, we're spending a lot more time in technology. So it's harder to, like, you know, uh, the weather. How many times do we just go, oh, let me go check the weather. Let me go check this. Let me go check my favorite stock. Let me go check. What are you checking? But you're checking all this stuff. And then it just like speeds up the treadmill faster and faster and faster. Then suddenly I'm going to go pray. Ah, <laughs> now you're out of breath. <laughs> right. So, so what's, so, um, what is prayer? Uh, I like to consider prayer in the simplest terms. It is, it is getting in touch, entering into communion with the one we love. And it can be done in many different ways. And formal prayer is just meant to be the springboard for that communion. Mm -hmm. 
with the Lord. So you recognize his presence first. Like a good marriage, you say what's in your heart and then you listen to what's being said back to you. And unlike a human relationship, you need to discern what it is you're listening to and make sure you're not listening to yourself, right? And what you are listening, you properly understand. Yeah, so how do we know, what, how do I know when God is actually speaking to me and it's not just Steve speaking to myself? Right. right. Well, the okay. So now to answer that question, we have to answer this question. Okay. Um, what does it mean to be prayerful versus saying prayers? And prayerful, in my mind, prayerfulness is coming to a place in life where you recognize God's presence, right? Even when you're not formally praying. So you're mindful of his presence in the ordinary moments of life. So why is that important? Because it's in the ordinary moments of life you will receive the confirmation of what you received in your formal prayer. It's like a note. You hmm. hit the note. It echoes and re-echoes and echoes further. Same thing. What you hear in your prayer, what you experience in your formal prayer, will echo in the rest of your life if you tr if you if you train your mind and heart to be to be aware of God's presence in the rest of your life because he will send signs he will send confirmation sometimes it's a thought that comes into your mind sometimes it's being surprised by an event in your life sometimes it's something that a friend or neighbor or stranger will say to you sometimes you'll be sitting in a in a mass and a homily just strikes you right there will be confirmation that what I'm hearing of the Lord, what I believe the Lord said, is now been confirmed for me. Mm. But if you don't have that prayerful stance, then that question is very hard to answer. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Is that is that also the same way that we would um, discern his will for us? We say, well, his will for us is his love for us. His love for us is his presence for us. See, we divide it all up, and it's just God's presence to us. Hmm. So in God's presence, he's affirming, he's supporting, he's loving, he's willing, he's guiding, he's protecting, he's defending, all at once. So the perfect, enduring love of God for you and me will always guide us, always lead us. And that's what his will is for us. And that's where holiness starts. Hmm. Right? To know and do God's will is holiness. Yeah. Then, Excellency, so when we're actually uh, in the act of prayer, mm -hmm. there's clearly um, value in prayers that we've been handed down, like the Our Father or the Hail Mary, the, the Memorare. Right what yeah. about um, spontaneous prayer? Is there more value to one versus the other and and also how do we get better at spontaneous prayer okay um i would say this formal prayers are absolutely essential to start the calming process let's go back to the treadmill you know we pray i pray the rosary every day many many do and thank god we have the the the, uh, the rosary but it's, it's, it's almost a mantra for a reason. It's a mantra because um, it's meant to calm the spirit. So formal prayer always has to be part of our spiritual life. Now, having said that, prayer is not meant to be a time when we only say formal prayers and when we're done, we finished. Hmm. Because then we really haven't given God the proper honor and time, place in our lives, to be able to respond to us. 
So praying in your own words is interesting because prayer, when you express it in your own words, you are giving expression to what you are thinking and feeling, right? And it has tremendous value. But many times, just being in God's presence does the same thing without words. So some people are very uncomfortable, in my experience, praying spontaneously because they believe it is too informal to address God in that way. And I could understand that sensibility. But my response back to them is, if you're uncomfortable doing that because it seems too casual and familiar, then if you can calm your spirit and say nothing before the Lord but sit in his presence, you will be doing it without words. But that we need to do it is essential. Because hmm. that's where relationship is. So how do you learn to do it? Um, well, let me ask you a question. I'll put you on the spot. You ready? I think so. (laughs) All right. Do you communicate the same way with your wife now as you did when you first met her? Uh, No, it's definitely changed. We've been together, Mm -hmm. married 20 years. Yeah, it's changed. You've developed almost, if I could put words in your mouth, an intuition, right? So you, you read each other now in a different way. Even body language. Yes. Speaks. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the same, I think, uh, will occur in our relationship with God. That there is a change over time that allows us with maturity to be more receptive to what he wishes to tell us rather than we do all the talking. And the silence communicates. That's why adoration is such a beautiful way to pray. Because adoration gives us the opportunity to say and do nothing except sit in his presence. And I must confess, this is not a criticism. I have many, many uh, friends, brother bishops and priests, who use their holy hour to do a lot of things, which is good. But my counsel to them, as I remind myself, is part of that hour needs to simply to be. To be. And then you start, what you find is that you, you're talking to God. You are, on the deepest level, you're talking to God. You're, you're telling Him all your, 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 your deepest fears and anxieties. That's talking to God. That's spontaneous prayer. Yeah. Right? Or, or, or your, your pleadings. And then there's time for just, adora- you know, for praise and, and to thank him, which sometimes we don't do, right? We forget. So we ask, we ask, yes, we get, and then we move on to the next thing we want to ask. Stop and say thank you, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Say thank you. And how do you say thank you? you just, I, I don't think you have to say anything. You're just with a grateful heart. Just, just let the blessing sit in your mind and the way you feel. And the way your mind is drawn, it, that's the thank you. Right? Yeah. It, the gratitude spontaneous. It's not something we create. Yeah. So the spontaneity and is, is the key to praying in your own words. It's the two go hand in hand. I forget which saint it was. It might have been Teresa of Avila who said in adoration, she said, I just look at him and he looks at me. And yeah, I thought it was, uh, isn't that St. John Vianney? Oh, I, I, I knew it was some yeah. great saint. <laughs> yeah, I think it's John Vianney. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, um, and, and, and why, why do we ask? We've talked about this many times. You, I don't tire repeating of it. We don't ask to enlighten God. We ask so that we can receive the good things he promises us. Now, who listening to this podcast thinks 
that a diagnosis of cancer for them is something that can be a grace. But it can be. If, if we are attuned to God's presence at every moment of our life, as difficult as that may be to say, our life is not eternal here. And if God is permitting this suffering, he will bring goodness out of it for us, growth out of it for us. We will grow closer to him out of it yeah. because he'll never stop loving us. Yeah. Yeah. That, those are moments of profound prayer, right? Yes. It's in those, and it's in those, you know, the, the good, the good blessings that, that God gives us, they're wonderful and they're heartening, but your relationship with him really deepens and goes to another level when you go through those profoundly difficult times. John of the cross. The key to holiness is the cross. And what do you do on the cross? You surrender. So when your life is blessed, everything's going great. It is, at times, harder to surrender than when everything's taken away. Job, everything's taken away. You either rebel or you surrender. But when you surrender, it's not that you're capitulating, you surrender. You run into the arms of God and say, okay, I'm done. I yeah. have no idea how to do this. I don't have the I have no idea. So you want spontaneous prayer? I'm all yours. Lead the way. I'm done. I don't know what to do. Yep. Those moments, you know, and you know what? When you sit in an occasion, and it's my humble opinion, again, this shows you my, psych my psyche. So if there's psychologists listening to this, they're probably going to have a field day. <laughs> okay. If it comes to me, is one thing. But if it comes to someone I dearly love, it's a totally different reality. Yeah. And I would gladly accept it in my own life to avoid it being in the life of the person I love because that's where the real surrender is. Yes. Right? That's where you feel truly, truly helpless and in some sense invited to be set free. Right? And in prayer... Those are not the formal prayers that it's the, it's the, it's what comes after the formal prayer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we leave this segment, and we got five, five minutes left or so, I wanted to ask you um, about going back to formal prayers though. Um, mm -hmm. Two things. What do you think of lay people praying the divine office? And then also, um, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, Lexio Divina, it's mm -hmm. gaining in popularity. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first one, I absolutely advocate. Because it's the prayer of the church. It's not the prayer of clerics. Right? As you know, the office, the, the office originated in part in monastic life to bless the rhythm of the day. And for clerics, we promise to pray the office to bless the rhythm of the day. For us, it becomes a little bit more difficult because the rhythm of the day doesn't follow the monastic rhythm of the day. So you have things going on. So the hours don't always get prayed in the exact time where they should be prayed. That's just, that's just the truth. Right. But the morning prayer and evening prayer land in the morning and the evening, but day temperature is usually where it gets a little dicey as to where it lands. <laughs> All right. But the idea is to bless. So why would that not be the case for lay people too? I strongly encourage everyone to learn to offer the morning and evening prayers of the church at minimum. The office of read. I love the office of readings. Because you read some of the great saints and the mystics and their writings and Oh my gosh, and it gives me such tremendous opportunity to think through the day. Right? And remember, they're the commentaries on the scriptures. Basically, the fathers of the church were comment commenting on the scriptures. So it just fills in the in, in my understanding. I I you know, I just couldn't imagine 
not praying the office, the full office. And I would hope and pray every one of our listeners would get equally excited. I mean, you're in the car, you could get it on tape. Mm -hmm. You're on the subway or the train, you could, you could get Magnificat that has it. I mean, it's so readily available, right? Yeah, and plenty of apps also on your, for right. your phone. I would right. just put it in airplane right. mode so you don't get texts while you're in the middle yeah. of it. Right, right, exactly, right, right. And then if, <laughs> if you forget to put it back into the, when you turn it on, you got 500 messages. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you have the peace of mind. Yeah. Um, okay, and now Lexio Divina. Do you practice Lexio Divina? I have to admit I have not been able to um, get into it yet. Yeah. I myself, it's interesting you say that because I myself do not practice it as a as a rule either, although I pray over the scriptures every day. Right, my understanding of lexio divina is a, it's an it is a, a disciplined form of uh, of meditating on the scriptures, right? That allows you to break open it and apply it to your own life, right? Um, I I approach the scriptures in a slightly simplified way. And that is from my days at Regis when I was young. No more. Okay. Uh, one of my Jesuit professors, one of my teachers, spoke about reading the scriptures by simply imagining yourself as one of the characters. Yeah. Which forms part of Lexio Divina. It's part mm -hmm. of, you break it up. I find that to be absolutely a fruitful way to pray of scriptures because every story has a whole slew of people that you could approach the same biblical story from another perspective and just stay with that perspective during the day. And you know what I found the most challenging? Is when I read the gospel stories, stories about the Pharisees and Sadducees and put yourself from their perspective. Yeah. And ask yourself, well, what are they seeing? What are they hearing? And what did they bring to that conversation? And what prevented them from seeing what I see now in faith? Because the truth be told, if I were in their shoes in their time, I wondered to myself what my reaction would have been. Right. Right? But it gives you a sense of sympathy and empathy. It gives you a sense of, of the beauty of the truth that the Lord is teaching. Because it's seen from different angles which either invites you to believe or maybe the reason you step away because you can't believe or you can't accept or you can't surrender to. Yeah. But I would say this. I don't care how a person prays over the scriptures, to be very honest, but that the scriptures are a treasure that we as Catholics have not fully explored and used and profited from is absolutely the case. And... My hunch is, if we can unlock the power of the scriptures for young people, it is a powerful tool to evangelize them to the faith of the church. Because everyone loves stories. Yeah. And they are not stories that are fictitious. They are not stories that are history like written in the New York Times. They're just simply narration of facts. They are, they are the stories of the truth. Yep. So. Yeah. I encourage everyone to do that. And you know what? It, we still have time, don't we, before Christmas? And therefore, anybody who does not own a Bible and you know it, it's the ideal Christmas gift. You talk about stopping the train on its tracks. Go to a store, buy a, um, a, a version of the scriptures, you know, like uh, the, the New American Bible. Give it. It'll be the best gift you could give someone you love. People give books all the time. This is the word of God. It's the word this of God. This is the holy book. It is the good book. <laughs> right. All right, Excellency. Let's take one more break and uh, you can answer a question when we come back. Why do we need Catholic radio? Because not everybody is sitting in front of a computer or watching their television set at home. How about when driving to work? How about while at work at your desk? Catholic radio is there for you. I may be a Catholic priest, but I'm still a student of the faith. And Catholic radio helps supply good material, whether it be a question and answer format show, 
whether it be a show itself on doctrine or theology, I myself, as a priest, am always learning. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Um, Excellency, I'm going to, for this week's question, I'm going to um, paraphrase and put into my own words an anonymous question from a couple conversations I had with two wonderful people who I look up to in many ways. Mm-hmm. They were talking about their um, adult children and the norms of society today that fly in the face of Catholic values and teaching so that even our kids who grew up learning the faith think that what is wrong is right and normal. And so uh, when adult children pretty much walk away from the church after a lifetime of being taught and not defiantly or overtly, just you know, little by little, that, that creep of societal norms now, how can seduction. parents? Yes, seduction. Is the, the pull word. of the world. Yes. How can parents bring those kids back? They may not be able to. They may not be able to. It doesn't mean someone can't do it. Right. That's a very hard lesson. We've talked about this before. It doesn't absolve a parent from trying. But you should not be discouraged if you are not the one who can do it because you see a parent is meant to create the seedbed for faith and through the parents love and example and witness plants the seed but we know the parable of the seed lots of things can happen that can choke the seed from growing the way you want it to grow but it doesn't mean the seedbed is dead what it means is you ask the question, who is going to break open the soil? And my experience has been that parents, relatives, uncles, are not always the person who can do it the second time. Hmm. But there are others. So what do we do? We keep throwing seed and pray not only for the children, your children, but pray that someone will come along who will be the one to break open the soil when you least expect it. Now, I had, maybe it was in our last podcast, I don't remember where this, if I heard this from one of my meetings or in our conversation, so forgive the, the, the um, if I'm repeating myself, but someone recently told me that they send the link of Sunday Mass to their adult children. It's one of the unexpected consequences of the pandemic. So literally, church is coming to them. Mm -hmm. And no, it was, I know where it was. It was not in our podcast. And this gentleman said, it's beginning to have an effect. Wow. So they're opening it because he can tell whether they open it or not and how long they stay on. And there's times when they stay through the whole celebration. Yeah. So who was to say, who would to think that technology, as, as, as problematic as it is, could actually be a, a, a means of evangelization? It's throwing seeds. Yeah. All right, so let me summarize. Number one, do not be discouraged. Please do not be discouraged. Intensify your prayer that someone can touch their hearts, even if it may not be you at this point. Number two, keep throwing seeds. Send the prayer cards. Um, Send the links. Not nagging. Every once in a while, one of those seeds may grow, right? That's number two. And number three, and I think the most important part of this whole thing is to intentionally lift them up in prayer to be protected when they are in the world. Because it's one thing to go into the world and be seduced by the world and come out in one piece. But there are many who get seduced by the world and have terrible experiences. Yeah. Tremendous baggage to pray for their protection. St. Michael, St. Raphael, St. Gabriel, the archangels, the guardian angels, ask them to protect them while they're wandering. Yeah. Keep them safe. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. You know what occurs to me, Bishop Frank, is that as parents, we can do... Um, you know, a good job of catechizing and sacramentalizing our kids, but it's not up to us. 
they, they need to have that encounter with Jesus. Absolutely. And we can't do that for them. Absolutely. You see, the other thing too is, this could be a show on it to itself. Um, if a person does not have an, a true experiential affective experience of being loved, then they will not fully encounter a God who is love. They will not understand what that means in the deepest level of their lives. So most parents have desperately tried to love their children as they were growing up. But in unlike former ages, the distractions that we just described lend them at times to wonder. Yeah. And that is an unfortunate consequence of the world we have created wonder about whether they are really loved by their parents. And the fact that their parents told them, no, you cannot do this. They say, well, he, they don't love me. No, no, it's just the opposite. But the world will say that to them. Right. Because the world says your life is all about you, so you should get everything you want. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if you have a question for Bishop Frank... Send it in to us. You can send it on social media. You can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. Um, Excellency, would you please give us your blessing? Just let's preview for our listeners. Next episode, we're going to talk about Christmas stories. Yes. I have a ton. Christmas with the Caggianos. <laughs> oh, it's, going to be, it's just going to be a riot of a time. Just awesome. as a preview. <laughs> in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next week. Amen. Thank you, Excellency. 